Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. Turn on your digital device. Switch from solitaire to scripture. <laughs> We're going to finish our series on 1 Peter strengthening the believers. And at the end of this service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to the next step of ministry that I see being vitally important for our church here at Berean. We're going to give you an opportunity to respond to that. I am absolutely convinced that the next step for us is to take advantage of the shutdown and the rebuilding that we've been part of and establish a ministry that will be healthy and strong. And one of the great needs here right now is for us to be able to minister to one another pastorally, to be able to build one another in discipleship and care for one another's needs. Now, if you multiply the number of people that attend here, our attendance based on the people that we reach, it's too big a group for our pastoral staff to take care of. A lady uh, talked to me this morning in first service, I mean during this service in the North Chapel, is having a knee replacement surgery this week. And we have to have a way to be able to minister that. Does that make sense to you? And the work of leadership is to raise up workers for the harvest field and for the discipling of the body. And I still am convinced that life change happens best in small groups that pastoral care happens best in small groups. And we have struggled with that for 11 years. It's time to quit struggling and just do it. Amen. So if we're going to just do it, that means there's some other things. I need you to hear me clearly. It means there's some other things that aren't coming back. Thank you. How <laughs> many understand that? Life is going to be different than it was so that we can do it better. Now, I'm going to give you a little teaser for next week's series. I felt like God dropped something in my heart. I have a Bible on my, in my bookcase on my desk right now that was from the founding pastor of this church. Um, uh, oh, and her name escapes me. Some of you know. Nellie Cox. Man came through here several years ago with his Bible in a Ziploc bag and said, that was my grandmother or great-grandmother or whatever, and I've had this Bible and don't know what to do with it, and I just felt like God said you should have it. And so I've been kind of looking through that Bible, and while we were at general counsel, couple that with some things that I felt like God began to speak to me about, I don't have any desire to go back and do things in the old way. No desire to do that. But there are some old paths that we've forgotten that the church of days gone by understood that we need to reclaim. There's some things that a previous generation understood that in our new methods that are good and healthy, we have set aside and we need to reclaim those. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you to not go back to the old methods, but there are some old paths that we need to reclaim if we're going to see the spirit of God released in this generation. And I want you to join me in that journey. And the idea of small groups is not a contemporary concept. How do you know that? Because I read in Acts chapter 2 that when they went to the temple daily, they joined together in homes. And they developed and grew and discipled and cared for one another. So small groups will be more than a plan or a program. We want that to be a ministry context that enables us to join together in healthy ways and build our lives around the word of God and take care of each other. How many are with me in that? You understand what I'm saying? That's what we're driving for and that means that some old ways of doing things won't return and we're going to move into some new ways of doing things. In chapter 1 of 1 Peter, we understood that leadership or the brethren are going to be strengthened. Those who would be under shepherds have to value or celebrate the new birth. That's what all this is about, that men and women, boys and girls will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Once you come to faith in Christ, there needs to be a desire for pure spiritual milk, authentic Christian faith experiences that you are interacting with God. 
And once those happen for the church to be healthy, Peter says that we need to learn the power of submission. And that's something that is really, really difficult for the American capitalistic uh, independent world to get their brain around, that we need to learn the power of submission. And chapter four, to recognize the value of suffering. So we're talking about the new birth. We're talking about genuine spiritual experiences that will cause us to learn how to submit to one another and recognize the hard times that God wants to teach us through. So he concludes his epistle with some instruction on what it means to be a servant leader. That if you're going to be a leader in the kingdom of God, you cannot look for ways to be elevated. You need to look for opportunities to serve. Looking for service opportunities. How can I serve? Who would that apply to? Every child of God needs to be a leader looking for an opportunity to serve. You say, well, I'm not a leader. Yes, you are. If you look around, there is somebody that's following you. There's somebody that you're influencing. Why not use that for the sake of the kingdom? Looking for opportunities to serve. And Peter talks to us about that model, not of elevating, a position but of servant leadership at the end of this message I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to being part of this new direction that we need to go as a church and I hope that all of you will consider what God would have you do serving others provides its own reward positional climbing of the ladder seeks reward from others for achievement. Super, or servant leadership recognizes and experiences the value of doing something for someone else brings with it its own validation. I wasn't going to do this, but I just feel like I should right here. Um, I've been debating whether to do this or not. I shared this with our staff, and I want to be careful how I share this right now because my wife is here. (laughs) But my wife is passionate about teen Bible quiz. And if you are between the ages of 12 and 18, you know that. Because she will find you and talk to you about that. And what do I think about it? I, am, I see incredible value in Teen Bible Quiz today. Today, if I quote a verse, or when you hear me quote verses, do you know where the bulk of my scripture memory happened? In my senior high years in Teen Bible Quiz, committing those to memory, that when I graduated 10 or 12 years ago... <laughs> are still with me today. We need to get the word of God in our students. And if we do, God will raise out of that an army of young men and women who will change the world for the kingdom. And they'll never do it by training and talent and skills. They'll do it by the power of God and the influence of the word of God. And that's what we need to get in their hearts. Okay, how many are hearing me at this point? So, having said that, um, I do know that whatever my spouse is involved in will have an impact on me. (laughs) And um, I I wish I could plug her ears right now, but I don't need something else to do. And I'm going to tell you truthfully, when we do quiz meets and I'm there as a quiz master and I'm helping out, I'm just going to tell you that I don't get up that morning and say, I don't go to bed that night saying, I am so excited that I get to be a quiz master tomorrow. I I don't, I don't. I think I'm good at it, and I'm glad to contribute, but it's another thing to do. How many are hearing me right now? How many of you know that sometimes you just have other things to do that for the sake of seeing the next morning, you have to do? (laughs) But you know where the reward is? I'm just going to tell you, Bible quizzers, and you'll you'll agree to this. Um, Occasionally, we have them all come to our house. That's like turning your home into a zoo. And they're everywhere. There are shoes everywhere. I mean, they're everywhere. And I'm watching all that. But the reward is... I know those kids by name. And they know me face to face. And I have a relationship with them that I don't have with kids outside that program. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
So listen to me right now. If you don't get anything else, get what I'm saying right now. Your service isn't about whether it makes your life easier. It's about whether you're investing and modeling and changing lives and that becomes its own reward. And when you look at small groups, well, I don't have time. I don't have the energy. My home's not ready. Really? What do you want to say on judgment day? I want to say, God, I gave you my vehicle. I gave you my home. I gave you my time. And these are people that I poured into, that I invested in, that I did life with. And that's what will matter when we come to the end of the journey. Servant leadership is what the kingdom is about. Not leadership that is easy for you. The team has heard me say, our team has heard me say over and over again, that when we're planning and strategizing... A plan that makes life easier for the staff doesn't motivate me. And all the staff said, (laughs) but a plan that rings us out and leaves everything on the canvas that touches someone for the kingdom, that's what gets me up in the morning. Come on, someone help me now. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking to you about servant leadership. Peter is saying if we're going to make it through the times of scattering and isolation and the persecution that they were under, leaders have to understand, every child of God needs to understand that we have been called not to be served, but to serve. And that always costs you something. So what's required of us as we lead where God calls? Number one, the first four verses, that we model servant leadership. He talks about the elders in verse one that are among you. Leaders rise up within the body of Christ. You can look at leaders in other places and admire them, but if God's going to build his kingdom in the local church, as scripture declares, then leaders rise up within the body where there's accountability, where there's relationship, where people know you. It implies that there is a relational connection before there is ever leadership privilege. It implies a relationship connection before there is ever leadership privilege. Service marks success not being served. We will be successful when we're serving one another. The increasing note here, or the interesting note, is to consider that he's talking about serving where he failed the most, where he gave up, where he didn't stand his ground. The elders that are among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering. He mentions that. Where did Peter fail? When he was watching Christ's suffering. I don't know him. He backed away, but out of that, he recognized the power of that moment and said, those are the people that God will use in leadership. Suffering, um, sharing and suffering with Jesus leads to sharing in his glory. So what is an elder? What's he talking about in verses two and three? An elder is a term of rank or office achieved over time. And I'm, I'm just, I, I'm going to just say this because I think it's a biblical order. Getting old doesn't make you wiser. Don't point, just nod. (laughs) But there there are some things that will never be learned until you get older. There is the person who has had 40 years of experience 40 times, one year at a time. They've lived the same year over and over and have never grown. And then there are others who are at an older age that I aspire to (laughs) that have experiences that should give them a level of credibility because of the scars and marks that they carry on their body. And that takes time. And elders should be respected within the body for what they bring to the table. Are you diminishing young leadership? Oh, no, I'm not. There's a reason. There is a reason why your young men see visions and your old men dream dreams. 
<laughs> There's a reason for that. I get that. However, there needs to be an interaction that we'll get to in a moment, but there's a respect. The term does refer to age and experience. And the responsibility is to tend or care for the flock and to watch over the flock. Do you know how you can tell a spiritual elder? Because their life is driven by what's best for the body, not what's best for them. They're caring for the flock. And that term watching over them, the word does not imply the entrance upon a responsibility. So it's not talking about being given a title or a job. It doesn't uh, imply the entrance upon a responsibility, but the fulfillment of it. Listen to this. Being an elder is not a matter of assuming a position, but a discharge of duties. You can be elected to the board at Berean and not be a spiritual elder. And you can be uh, not a member of the board and be a spiritual elder because that's a spiritual office that God calls to and leads to. And how do you tell? It's people that assume the responsibility of caring for the body. Is anyone hearing me this morning? Elders assume that. It's my job. I need to make this better. I need to own it. I need to care for people. You see, one who's a spiritual elder would never call and say, Pastor, I just heard that Joe is in the hospital. You need to go see him. You know what an elder would do? An elder would go to the hospital and see Joe and call me and say, I just saw Joe and prayed for him. And here's what God did while I was there. Do you see the difference? Elders take ownership and watch over the flock and care for the body. And we need to see that happen for this body to be vibrant and powerful. It assumes not a position, but a discharge of duties. Why? Because the chief shepherd is coming back. Jesus is going to return. And all those that serve him will receive a crown of glory. So we don't do it for dishonest money or benefit. We don't do it for what we'll receive. We do it because it honors the chief shepherd shepherd who's coming back one day hallelujah he's coming back he said he would for a church without spot or wrinkle and we need to be all about building that if we're going to be leaders we have to model servant leadership well how does that happen well verses five to nine you've got to clothe yourself with humility <laughs> ah. don't see much of that anywhere today <laughs> humility toward others verses five and six in the same way you are younger submit yourself to the elders all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another why because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble do you know what would happen if we all just brought our gifts to the table and respected one another? It is wrong for me to look at a young adult and say, you don't know what you're talking about, unless they really don't know what they're talking about. But to dismiss them because of their youth is wrong. But to dismiss me that I'm out of touch because of my age is wrong. Because some truths are timeless. The only way for this to work is all of us to put on clothes of humility. Now let me illustrate it this way and try to bring this together because there needs to be a joining together of the generations for this to happen. And when we talk about small group ministry and joining together in servant leadership, if you have a group of people that you don't want to minister to, you need to look at whether or not you're really a leader. I don't know, I want those young punks in my group or I don't want those old people in my group. Let me tell you what I know. I know that both bring important values to the table. I had, a, I had a marking moment some years ago at youth convention. I'm standing in there in the convention hall, and you think this is loud? If you think our worship to this morning is loud, you need to go to a Gaither concert. No, I was there and measured it. So what I understood in that moment is that the argument over volume is an argument over taste. 
I don't like the song, so I complain about the volume. Is anybody in the house now? Shout me down. No, I'm telling you what. I was at that Gaither video, and I thought blood was going to come out of my ears, but I loved it because it was my, song, my music. <laughs> and old people do need it louder. <laughs> Just see if you're listening, people. But I'm standing in this youth conference... And I am telling you what, I felt like my brain was vibrating out of my head. And I'm just like, oh, oh, I'm going to die here on the spot. And so I'm walking to the back, hoping it'll get softer. But I think it picked up energy as it bounced. But you know what I saw? I saw hundreds of teenagers with their hands in the air, jumping up and down, giving praise to Jesus. And if you're going to complain about that, would you please quarantine yourself for the rest of your life? And a lady, listen, are you still with me? A lady that I know and respect came walking out and she was angry as as she could be and she looked me in the eye and she said, there isn't any way you can call what's happening up there worship. And how many of you have met me before? I, I, Pastor Larry, I get great words from God when I'm ticked off. I mean, but I felt like God gave me a word and I looked at her and said, and there isn't any way one of those teenagers is going to call what you do worship. Why don't we quit criticizing and march to the throne together? You want to know what the heart of a senior adult is? Don't criticize it as well with my soul till you hear the moments and the experiences, the times when they were at the end and there was no answer and they tried everything they could try and Jesus showed up and they got up from there singing, it is well with my soul. If you'll hear the stories of an older generation, it will inspire the faith of a younger generation generation that he will be with you in the valley he'll be with you in the storm and I can tell you that not because I read a book but because I was in that boat and he met me there come on shout now somebody help me but you know what the greatest hindrance to innovation is old people who don't believe it can be done that's a fact I can show you that in business before, before you criticize a younger generation, would you shut up for 10 minutes and let them share with you their vision, their desire, their passion? Don't tell them it can't be done. They might build a church in the middle of Iraq. They may storm the gates of hell in ways that you and I have never imagined. They may build the greatest church that's ever been built because I don't think the greatest church has been built yet or the greatest ministry has been launched yet. It's going to come from the next generation. Listen to their vision. Listen to their passion. Don't tell them it can't be done, but feed their fire. And together... I have stories that can help you. A younger generation of stories that can inspire me. But it can't happen until we wear clothes of humility. Let's put on humility. We got something to learn from each other. We've got something to learn. I'm going to tell a Disney story here. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't going to say that. I'm going to tell a mouse land story. If I'm going to say Disney, I want money for product placement. (laughs) Now, how many of you have ever gone on a trip with a family, with family members? And how many of you during the trip wondered if this was really a good idea? (laughs) Come on, be honest. Don't be a liar now. Jesus might come. 
Because families seem to think they have freedom to squabble where you don't with guests, right? Right? Come on, hang with me. I didn't ask my wife if I could tell this. This could get me in trouble. But she said something profound to me. And I don't know if you know my family, but we don't have anybody that lives at our house or has ever lived at our house that doesn't have an opinion about what to do next. Okay? Those people don't exist. We all have opinions and we're all right. And how many of you know that when you, when you build that model, you have to live with those consequences? I mean, I wish you could have seen my daughter, Crystal. She had a bright yellow Mary Poppins umbrella and she was charging on ahead and she'd hold that up and knew that her, that her uh, dad would find her eventually. And if I went there soon enough, she'd pop it open. We'd see this bright yellow umbrella. And she had a Mary Poppins bag that if you needed a leg amputated, she had the tools there. I mean, she had everything in that bag. It was unbelievable. But there was a moment where there's some miscommunication and it seemed as though there might have been some tension. Oh, I'm scared to death right now. So I, I wasn't there at that moment. I, there were other things going on. And so I called my wife and I said, are you upset or are they upset? Is something going on? Is someone upset? And she said, no. You ready for this? I'm going to have you write this on your mirror. I want you to write this on your refrigerator. I, I'm not for tattoos, but I'd tattoo this on your arm. She said, no, there's no time for that. Is anybody in the house now? I said, is there anybody in the house now? What if we decided that the end was close and that our vision mattered and that reaching the loss was a priority and building the kingdom was what we're about and then we had these little clashes and our little feelings got hurt and our cupcake melted like a snowflake instead of getting all worked up we look at each other and say I'm fine because there's no time for this there's no time for squabbles there's no time for pride there's no time for self interest there's no time for any of this because we've got a world to reach for the kingdom there's no time Time for that. Put it away and let's do what we're called to do. Come on, someone help me this morning. There's no time for that. There's only time to keep pressing on. And at Mouseland, you have to press. Well, how do you do that? How many have ever had your feelings hurt? How many have had your feelings hurt already in this message? Come on, hold up your hand. You've had your feelings hurt. How do you, four of you. All right, listen, I can make it unanimous here in about 30 seconds. Just give me a moment. If, I, if I'm not hurt your feelings up to this point, I'm an equal opportunity offender. I'll get to you. Don't worry about it. I don't do it on purpose. It just happens. We get our feelings hurt. And how can you take a moment? Is anybody with me right now? Somebody needs to hear this. How do you take a moment when your feelings are hurt? Because you can't control that. You can't control that initial reaction. Feelings don't have to be right, but they are real. So what do you do with that? You put on humility. We're loving one another. There's bumps and bruises. I get my feelings hurt. How do I deal with that? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. In those moments, you know what you do? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care on him. Come on. Casting all your care on him. Jesus, that hurt my feelings. And then when you see your feelings hurt, just see him hanging on the cross. And saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See him hanging on the cross and saying to the thief on the other side, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Cast your care on him. And he won't condemn you or criticize you. He will care for you. And there are times I need someone to just hug me and say understand how you feel and I'll love you through it but we've got to get that pain healed up first you cast your care on him not on faith
Facebook, not on Twitter, not on some other social media, not on somebody that will listen to you, not on somebody that was involved. You cast all your care on him because he cares for us. Give it to him. Cast your care on him. And then what do you do? Verse 8 and 9. You stand fast in the faith. The devil wants to destroy you. And you know the best way for him to destroy you? Is to whisper in your ear. Criticism of other members of the body of Christ. And he'll get you all worked up and mad and whisper things. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, how? Standing firm in the faith. I'm a child of God. I put on my clothes of humility. We're going to build the kingdom of God. I'm going to cast my care on him. And I'm not going to let the devil drive me off the ground that I've earned, that I've claimed, that I hold. Because you aren't the only one struggling. You're not the only one struggling. (laughs) I'm just going to say this. I've been trying not to say it. But I've been amazed at how many unbelievers know today how believers ought to live. More than at any other time. And it all has to do with your personal conviction concerning um, COVID mitigation. So I'm not going to go any further than that. But you have to understand that there are attacks on every... What is happening here? The devil is going about like a roaring lion, doing his best to divide believers against believers so that we won't stand together. I don't care. I mean, I do care. But it doesn't matter to me at this juncture what position you take on masks. I saw, I told you this, a lady on the airline was wearing goggles and double mask. I've seen goggles, double mask, and a face shield. And if you want a face shield, if you want to do that, I'll support you in that. But you have no right to start blowing other people up because they see the world through different eyes than you see them. The kingdom is bigger. Come on. We need to stand firm in the faith. We need to stand where it really does matter and support one another and make um, the body of Christ strong. Stand firm in the faith. You're not the only one struggling. You're not the only one struggling. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. For a number of years, I did door-to-door, we called it evangelism, and I think in all, I've knocked on hundreds of doors. Bum, 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 bum. Could I take a few minutes to tell you about Jesus? I've had dogs sicked on me. I had a gun pulled on me. I've had all kinds of things happen to door-to-door evangelism. That's why I don't do it anymore. And because it wasn't effective. But I'll never forget knocking on an apartment door. (laughs) And this dear, sweet, older lady came to the door. I said, ma'am, could I take a couple minutes to talk to you about Jesus? And she said, sure. And I used the EE line. If you were to die tonight and stand before God, and he were to say, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? She looked at me and she said, if you only knew the troubles I've seen, you wouldn't have to ask me that. Well, I was like in my 20s. That didn't help, that didn't work with me. And I said to her, ma'am, I've, I don't know what troubles you've seen. And the troubles you've seen don't relate, relate at all to the question I'm asking you. A lot of people have seen troubles that aren't right with Jesus. And she didn't want to answer that and then she went on her way. And I know that she wanted some sympathy and I wasn't mature enough to give that to her. But this whole idea, sometimes we feel like No one's paying the price that I'm paying. No one's suffering like I'm suffering. No one has it as hard as I have it. Listen, there's no one in the U.S. that can say that. Look at third world countries and compare the poorest of our poor with the wealthiest of the wealthy in some of those underdeveloped nations and you'll quit whining about the soup that you had last night. We get bent out of shape because a waitress didn't bring our coffee hot. And they're people that don't have water to drink. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You're not the only one suffering. 
So understand, the devil is trying to amplify that. So, we're going to model servant leadership. We're going to clothe ourselves with humility. And he says in verses 8 and 9, to stand firm in the faith. But when you stand, watch, when you stand firm in the faith, you need to also stand fast in grace. Because some people stand firm in the faith who have no grace. And they become critical of others. Why aren't you standing where I stand? Why have you backed up? What is wrong with you? And get a bad spirit and a critical heart. If you're going to stand firm in faith, then you need to stand fast in grace. Because the Bible tells us he's the God of all grace. Look at verses 10 and 11. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Why? Because he's the God of grace. What happens when we struggle? What happens when we've had difficult times? Peter uses the word restore. When you're converted, when you come back, he'll make you strong. Peter is telling his personal testimony. I went through a struggle. I fell on my face. And you know that sometimes the challenge is bigger than you are. And we say to one another, well, God won't let you, God won't let you uh, struggle with anything too big for you to struggle with. You know, he'll never put you through that. And the only people who say that are people that aren't in a struggle. He has promised to be with you. He has promised to provide a way of escape. But when you're in the middle of the struggle and you're just going through it, sometimes we fall down. And who meets us there? Not the God of justice. Not the God of judgment, but the God of all grace. Whoo! I said the God of all grace will meet us there. I just said to Peter, if you deny me, I'll never, I'll never talk to you again. But, but Jesus said, when you're converted, I'm going to use you to strengthen the brethren. Why? Because he's the God of grace. And there has to be room. I have a story. I wish I could tell you the details. But I know of a, a worship pastor in, uh, outside of our area who had a moral failure, left a church, has been on a journey of rebuilding his life. And next month, God has restored. He'll be back in that ministry position. And people are wondering how that's going to work in the same place, in the same church. And I'm just telling you that there has to be room in the body of Christ for people to come back and be loved and cared for. That doesn't mean they're not held accountable. You hold them accountable. You recognize the weakness, but they need to be welcomed back because our God is a God of all grace. Verse 12 then says, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. That's where you have to stand. And when you're standing there, when you're in a place that you're modeling servant leadership, you're clothed with humility, you're standing in grace. Verse 13. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends her greetings. Now, I don't know what that means. Nobody knows what that means. Everybody thinks they know. I'm just going to tell you how it reads to me, and you can put whatever interpretation you want there. I don't believe this is allegorical. I don't think it's figurative. I think Babylon could refer to a place in Asia, not the um, Old Testament Babylon. But here's what I think. It, this is what it spoke to me as I was reading this text. Babylon represents everything that is contrary to Jerusalem. And when he doesn't say her name, it must mean that she would be put at risk if her name were to be mentioned. And he says to her, don't forget our faithful sister who's living in Babylon. How would you apply that today? I would say, don't forget our faithful sister who's living in Afghanistan. Don't forget our faithful sister who's living in the inner city. 
Don't forget our faithful sister who's ministering to the spiritually depraved in places that you and I wouldn't go. And historically, I'm just telling you, historically the strength of our movement has been women who were willing to go into Babylon where men weren't willing to go. Come on, I'm telling you the truth. You read the history of our foundation, fields were opened by women who had a passion and a call and an anointing. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying they went because men wouldn't. I'm saying they demonstrated their character and their bravery because they went where men wouldn't go. They weren't afraid of the challenge. He's saying, we have a sister, don't forget her. And the next time you feel bad about your circumstance, remember our sister that's living in Babylon. Come on. We need to remember them. He mentions Silas, and then I love that he says, and so does my son Mark. Who is Mark? Mark wrote what we would call the second gospel. He's John Mark that started on a missionary journey and went home whining to mama. And then Barnabas wanted to bring him back on and Paul said no and Paul went on his way and Barnabas went to build on him. At the end of his life, Paul says about John Mark, bring Mark to me. He's faithful to me, to the ministry. And he's saying, Mark has become my son. Most people believe that the gospel of Mark was written by John Mark who walked and and followed and shadowed the apostle Peter and gathered information from him and put it together in a book form. I believe that's who he's talking about here. And what's he saying? Peter is saying, I know what it meant to fall when Jesus needed me. John Mark knows what it is to fall, but we're comrades because we've both gotten up and I've poured into him and I've helped rebuild him and he's become my son in the faith, John Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. (laughs) Not happening. I'm just telling you, don't try it to me after service. I'll give you a punch of faith. (laughs) Right in the old kisser. Because that's not what it's saying. Now, how many of you know that other countries, if you're in the Middle East, African countries, the world is different than it is here. Men in many places of the world commonly walk together and hold hands. Ain't happening here, I'm just telling you. (laughs) And kissing was simply an expression of greeting. What he's saying is, show your affection to one another. It needs to be expressed. Because here's what marks the body of Christ. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. If the church is in Christ, it will be at peace. How will it be at peace? Because we understand the value of servant leadership. Because we've put on robes of humility and we're standing fast in grace. And that place will have abundant peace because we really will love one another. Hallelujah. Pastor Nathan, if you'd come. We are all called to care and to serve. And I do believe our next best step is small group ministry. This is not an add-on to where Berean Church is headed. This is not just something cool for us to try because it'll grow the church. I believe it's essential for the building of the body of Christ in this place. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. How many of you have the ability to text. You have a phone that will text. Hold up your hands. I just want to know. If you don't have the ability to do what I'm going to ask next, you can do the same thing with an offering envelope. Put your name on it and and the keyword and drop it in the box because I want everyone to be able to respond. But if you're willing to be a part of small groups in one of two ways or both, you're willing to say, I'm willing to lead a group or I'm willing to host a group in my home, or I'm willing to do both. Okay, that's what I'm asking. Not if you're willing to attend, and some, that may be all you can do, that'd be great. 
want everyone to attend, but you're saying, I feel like God is quickening something in me and I'm willing to step up. I'm afraid. I don't know what it means. I don't know what's going to be required of me. The only thing that'll be required is your tithe has to go to 50%. (laughs) Kidding. We'll do training. We'll equip you. We'll put materials in your hands. They'll be short. We have three trimesters planned, three short six-week trimesters built around connect, grow, and serve. It's going to be revolutionary to the church. So if you're willing to say, I'm willing to lead a group or host a group in my home, well, can I host a group at the church? No, it's not an option. It has to be in a home. Either lead it or host it or do both. Give me that slide if you would, please. I want you to text the word groups text the word groups, not connect groups, just the keyword groups to 515-512-9531. Right now, I want you to text that, the keyword groups, pardon me? What did I say? I went back to the beginning. 515-512-8878. 515-512-8878. Text the word groups to that number. Forget what I said first. Text it to that number. I want you to do it right now so that we can have an idea of how many are going to help us change the life and character and health of Berean to see it explode for the building of the kingdom. We need your help for that to happen. I'm waiting. I'm looking for thumbs to be moving. Servant leadership is what the kingdom is about. And if you're willing to ask Jesus to give you a servant's heart, let's all stand together and take just a moment to worship him and ask him to speak to us together.